Hi, uh, my name is Davey Morrison Dillard, and I will be moderating the forum today. So we're just going to really quickly introduce our panelists, uh, and then we're going to watch the film. Uh, so the film is a 20-minute documentary um, that explores the uh, some of the issues and the challenges and the rewards of uh, depicting true stories on film in Mormon cinema. So, so hopefully we'll have an opportunity once the film is ended. Um, we'll have a Q and A with with our panelists. Um, so, as you're watching it, be thinking about uh, the the questions that the film raises about um, the challenges of putting true stories on film, um, the importance of putting true stories on film, and some of the questions about uh, truth and what truth is that the film raises. Um, so, so be thinking of anything you'd like to talk with our panelists about. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to hand the mic down and have you guys introduce our, yourselves, actually. My name's Arthur Van Wagenen, and I produced the film you're going to see. And I think that's the only reason I'm on the panel. Uh, but these guys will have all the important stuff to say. Uh, my name is Garrett Batty, and I produced a film called The Saratov Approach. Uh, I'm Christian Vuisa. I started the film festival, and I made a film about Joseph Smith called Plates of Gold. I'm Sterling Van Wagden, and I uh, directed uh, parts two and three of the Work and Glory trilogy. James Dark, I'm curator of the BYU Motion Picture Archive, and a, an important collecting area is the Mormon image in motion pictures. Story has linked the family of man from the beginning. There's something about hearing stories about ancestors. They were passed on verbally and then written, and now we're, in, we're passing them on with film. There's something about that that ties us together. It, almost always true stories that I'm just pulled towards. Historians and filmmakers both have to sort through facts and put them into as much context as possible. Filmmaking by its very nature is a little more propagandistic, however, because you can't share an unlimited number of versions of the truth. You really only have time for one. So you have to have truth mixed with light. There are two kinds of truth. One kind of truth um, is what you can verify from the historical record and you can find out what's there and you can find out what you can justify in telling a narrative story in film. You have some touchstones there. The other kind of truth is, is what I would call imaging truth or messaging truth. And if, if you start with that end of the stick, that what this is about fundamentally is a message. It's not about a real human being with real emotions, real fears, real flaws, real Christian virtues and, and heroic qualities, all of those mixed together. But if you start with the messaging end of the stick, that's gonna very much take you in a different direction than trying to be true, even in that sense, to the historical record. Whether you lived in 1856 or whether you live in 2013, it's still the human experience. We can learn from them because those basic core values about perseverance, what's important to you and what you're willing to do to be honorable and have a good character, that's the same now as it was then. Ephraim's rescue tells the story of a man who was blessed with a few spiritual gifts. But he still wasn't a perfect man, but he tried, and he tried to find his way in life. Ephraim Hanks was 
called by Brigham Young with many others to go up and s try to save the Martin and the Willie Handcart Company. I see it's a good system. Bless you, Captain. When I'm considering uh, a person or a story that might make a good film, first thing is I have to find out it, what is that person's goal? What's he trying to accomplish? Does he accomplish it? What are the obstacles that come up in front of him? And is there some kind of uh, culminating ending that I feel like we can make? With Ephraim Hanks, boy, that came through just immediately. The Other Side of Heaven tells the true story of a Mormon missionary from Idaho who gets sent to uh, a remote Tongan island in 1953. It's a true story of Elder John H. Groberg's missionary adventures in Tonga. Elder Groberg has a very pure spirit, and he's a beautiful writer. And as I just began to read, I literally decided to make the movie after reading 15 pages of the book, because I could tell how much he loved those people and how much he loved that place. I just knew that was it. That was the one. It was a very sensitive thing to make a movie about a living, breathing, uh, working general authority of the Mormon church. And Elder Groberg and his family are very private people. His wife particularly was not excited about this idea. thing I had to do was convince them that they could trust me and then I had to honor that trust it was it was a, it was difficult sometimes to do everything because you're serving many masters you want to tell a great story you want to be true to history uh, and you want to tell the story of a three-year mission in about 120 minutes so how do you do that they're compromised life, he recorded his life story two times. They're both, both of these journals are lost. Really only because the church historian realized that this generation of pioneers was dying off. And he knew he had to do something about documenting them. And he started going around and talking to them, to some of these older pioneers and writing down their life story. He did that with Ephraim. If that wouldn't have happened, we wouldn't really hardly know anything about Ephraim at all. So in one sense, the research is pretty easy to do because there isn't that much. But on the other hand, that's good because that leaves some freedom. You have to write dialogue. You have to have characterization and people that meet each other and so forth. And I think because we don't have real complete journals and knowledge of those people, it opens it up. So you, you have to fill in some of that. Here's an example of something that I felt like I had to add to Ephraim's character. He was kicked out by his mother at a young age. He and his brother Sidney just told, get out. Well, I don't know that that bothered Ephraim the rest of his life. I don't know that. He never said anything about it in the little bit of writing we had. But I picked up on that and I used that, that throughout his life it just dug at him that he had a bad relationship with his mother. Because who doesn't want to be loved by their mother? I don't think that's that much of a stretch. But for me, that gave me this little chink that Ephraim had this and he wanted to overcome it. He didn't know what to do, but he just knew that that was not a good situation with his mother. And for me, it's one of the high points of the film is when we found a way to kind of rectify that and make Ephraim feel better about the relationship with his mother. You're a good man, Brother Hanks. And I'm certain wherever your mother is, she's very proud of you.
Now at this moment, Ephraim is healed. He has this moment where now he realizes, maybe I am a good man. I've been trying for 32 years, and at this point, it's all come together. That moment, though, shows us that not only was the Martin Handcart Company saved by Ephraim, Ephraim was saved in a very real sense by the Martin Handcart Company. Katila Vladi. Maya Sumashetche. Zakrela mina pet. Natsali dien. Zabrala spichki, zajigalki. No, what? We may never teach this guy, but we can be his friend. The Seratov approach is an inspiring true story about two missionaries in Russia. I think that the, the moment that I felt that I had to make this into a film was honestly when I first heard about the news story as a student at BYU when I was in film school. When I was in the position to finally approach this film and try to tackle it, the first, first goal was to reach out and find the, find the guys that it happened to. Uh, so I looked up uh, Andy Probst and Travis Tuttle tried to connect with them. We all came together up in Idaho one weekend and shut out the rest of the world. And just they just downloaded their story. I asked them to bring their journals, bring news clips, bring whatever they had to just tell me from day one to day five what happened. Yeah, I don't know. I just the only thing is I got a little bit of a weird vibe from it. Oh, I didn't. I think he seemed interested. He seemed genuinely interested. What helped? pushed me into uh, actually going forward with this story was seeing um, how the media currently treats LDS missionaries and were mistreated, were misrepresented. A lot of times the Mormon missionaries are, are portrayed as people that I don't relate to. And I was a missionary. And um, I see LDS missionaries as these heroic messengers of truth uh, that are protected by the hand of God. fundamentally unique aspects of Mormonism is the degree to which we are an authoritarian culture. Um, and we believe in following our leaders. Um, we don't believe they're infallible, but we kind of act like they are. Uh, therefore, anytime you start tackling any topic of Mormon history, you're in trouble because you can't put a wart on anybody without somebody jumping up and saying, wait a second, that guy's, he was the prophet. He was the, he was an apostle. He, she was, you can't do that. And I, and I think that cripples us. Well, I think it's particularly difficult for a Mormon artist to tackle any topic where any Mormon, let alone a Mormon leader, is imperfect. It's really difficult to do that because it's easy to be misunderstood. It's, uh, I'll give you an example. One of the most difficult scenes for me, and it's my favorite scene uh, in The Other Side of Heaven, one of the most difficult scenes to write was uh, when Elder Groberg's mission president, who hasn't seen him for almost a year, comes to visit him and is absolutely overwrought that Elder Groberg has baptized all these people and built all these chapels and created all these branches and hasn't filled out the appropriate paperwork. I, I don't know whose property it's built on, but everyone in Philomea knows. Everyone in Philomea, but no one in Salt Lake. Elder Groberg, the house of the Lord is a house of order. There are forms for these things. Forms. And it scared me to death when I wrote it. Why did it scare me? Why did it scare me? Well, because I knew that Elder Groberg loved his mission president. And I thought, 
Elder Grover might be sad because he would think the mission president's family who would see the movie would be sad. But the scene came flying out of my head onto the page and I loved it. I did, hardly changed a word of it after the first draft. I gave it to Elder Grover and I said, I have a concern about this scene. Now again, a non-Mormon, would they have been, they wouldn't have given a flying fig about, are you kidding me? But I was really concerned about it. Elder Grover, he said, no, he said, that's what happened. It's the truth. And then he said something that I'll never forget. He said, the truth always wins in the end. For a, a Latter-day Saint filmmaker, portraying Joseph Smith is a huge challenge because we all have a different sense of who the prophet Joseph was. Um, uh, in a way, in the Work and Glory films, uh, at least the two I worked on, uh, it's a little easier because Joseph Smith is interacting with fictional characters most of the time. So in some respects, it's a little easier. Um, but there were other instances when we were making the film um, uh, that were, I think, very telling. For example, there's one scene in the, in the second film, American Zion, <clears throat> where Joseph Smith and Brigham Young are on horseback and they confront Wilbert W. Boggs. You will not receive one acre, not one rifle. Any Mormon sets foot in Jackson County with malintent will pay for it. And I speak this with full authority from the governor. And I speak this with the full authority from God when I tell you that any injustice that you mete out upon his people will be returned upon your head and the people of Missouri a hundredfold. <laughs> Mr. Smith. And after we said cut on the scene, I remember one of the producers came up to me and said, whoa, whoa, do you think we, do you think we went too far? Do you think we just pushed it over the edge? When the producer asked me if we'd gone too far, what was, what was implied was, can we really portray Joseph as somebody who gets angry? That, that really was the question. And the very question itself um, indicates how sensitive um, I think all of us as LDS filmmakers are. I wouldn't feel like Ephraim is really well understood if people think that he's just so terrific and amazing that he was beyond anyone else's ability. Because we try to point out, and Ephraim himself points out, he was not a perfect man. He had all kinds of faults and problems. But the thing I love about Ephraim is he tried. And because he tried, he was able to be a vessel in the Lord's hands. Nobody's perfect. But Ephraim gives that point that if you try, if you keep trying, you can punch through. And even a man of the West like him, it was so tough that at one point he turned around and started coming back. Here came Arza Hinckley going the other way, and Arza Hinckley said to him, where are you going? I think you could find him when we couldn't. Brother Brigham sent me to find these saints, and I'll find them, or I'll give my life trying. That, that's, a, that's an amazing moment in church history for Arza Hinckley to be that forceful and be that committed that he's willing to give his life for these people that he doesn't know, he's never met, he has no connection with them, nothing. I seek to do what's right. So Ephraim, having his conscience stung by Arza Hinckley now, he has the guts to realize, I've done a wrong thing, and he turns his wagon around and goes back and goes up there and saves the saints. Keep the fire going, boys. <laughs> would not have turned that wagon around at that moment, many more saints would have died, many more would have had amputations and had many more problems through the rest of their life. But Ephraim was a big enough man that he knew that he did something wrong and he corrected it. I think watching this film, there are difficult moments to watch because of the intensity, because we have uh, a deep love for missionaries, and then to see them uh, suffer, it, it is difficult. At 
the same time, I think of all the stories uh, that have increased my faith when I look in the scriptures and I read about Alma and Amulek in prison, being stripped, being beat, and then watching the hand of the Lord come in and uh, crumble the walls and they walk out. And if we don't see what they went through, if we don't understand what they went through, then we minimize the hand of the Lord in what he's doing to save them. Our history is much more proximate, therefore it's much more accessible, therefore it's much more dangerous, I guess, in the eyes of some. There are certain truths in Mormon history and in Mormon doctrine that are really difficult. So do we want the South Park guys to take those issues on? Uh, or do we want to take them on in the light of faith? A filmmaker will always cater to the demands of the story first. But we ignore the realities of history at our own peril. There's always a tension between the portrayal of history and the actual history. If we resolve that tension by ignoring the difficult or uncomfortable parts of our history, we risk losing credibility with audiences, especially non-Mormon audiences. Our shared humanity is the most potent tool we have as Mormons to share the gospel and to bring light into the world. If they feel our humanity and then they see heroism modeled for them, then they can think, ah, I can do that too. Uh, that could happen to me also. I could overcome uh, whatever it is I have to overcome because that guy did or that girl did. President Hinckley used to talk about the church coming out of obscurity and out of darkness. And uh, I think that fear that we are somehow going to be damaged or hurt if we show a vulnerable side, if we show a side of ourselves that's flawed, I think that fear is gradually dissipating. I, I wish as media makers, as filmmakers, we could catch up with that vision. Uh, but we're not, we're not quite there yet, and it just may take a little time and a little more maturity. One of the best things that Ephraim Hanks teaches us is that great things can happen when preparation meets opportunity. Ephraim Hanks lived his life being prepared, getting ready for this moment, and then here came this opportunity, and he was ready. That's pretty promising for any of us to think that, you know, we don't have to be perfect. If we are trying, then maybe we're putting ourselves in a position where, where we can still do some good and help others in the world. And boy, I think for our generation, that's about as important of a message as there is. I'm curious, uh, Sterling, you mentioned early on in the film, and uh, it's something I think the whole uh, documentary is exploring, that there are uh, sort of multiple definitions of truth. There's uh, the truth of the historical record and um, objective reality to the degree that reality can be objective. and. Uh, and then there's other truths, truths of uh, mythological truths, of story structure, and aesthetic truths related to art. And, uh, and I'm curious, as, uh, as filmmakers and as uh, people who study film, um, how you navigate if, if tensions ever arise between those different kinds of truth, and if so, uh, how you navigate that in telling a story based on true events or, uh, or characters who, who, who once lived. Um, so uh, that question was directed to Sterling, but it's also directed to, to the whole panel. Anyone who'd like to answer? Um, well, I, I guess maybe one way to respond to that, um, Davey, is that um, 
Mitch Davis, I think, said this. There are so many masters involved when you're making a film. Uh, and there are so many uh, factors psychologically and emotionally and spiritually that I think all of us have, t have struggled to take into account. Uh, and some of those are positive and some not so positive. Um, and so when you come to this question of truth, the, the, interesting, uh, the interesting issue is what is the measure? What is the touchstone that defines the truth of any given moment in a film or a given scene or the entire film uh, in and of itself? Part of the reason I said there are two different kinds of truth is because there clearly is a historical truth that we have more or less access to. But there are also dramatic truths. And I think everybody who spoke in the documentary in some way was assuming that um, dramatic truth in, in the process of making a film trumps uh, historical truth. And that's because um, we're, we're not writing history books. Uh, we are creating dramas. And the point of the drama is to tell a story that engages an audience. So when, when I think about all the many masters involved, one master is who's the audience for the film. Another master is um, your investors. Another master is the distributor. Um, and if you're an LDS filmmaker, depending on sort of where you are uh, in your own spiritual maturity, and Mitch addressed this, um, you're looking over your shoulder to some extent and you're saying, well, what are the brethren going to think about this? Uh, is this going to get me in trouble with, uh, with the First Presidency or the Quorum of the Twelve? So there are a lot of factors here, and, and the, the issue of truth, I think, is, is a very, very muddy issue, not just for LDS filmmakers, but I think, um, I think for, for all filmmakers who aspire to do historical work. I don't know. Anybody else want to attack a shot? I, uh, as I watched this documentary, which I really enjoyed, you packed a lot into 22 minutes, that whole question of truth, um, let's think about where that was first asked uh, of Pilate. What is truth to the Savior himself? Uh, the Savior gave a very diplomatic answer. He didn't. I mean, after all, he is truth. And if Pilate couldn't see it, no explanation from the Savior could convince him of what truth was. But I, uh, what impressed me about the documentary was the dilemma that all of these filmmakers, including Sterling, found themselves in. Uh, and that was taking that last big gulp before risking a portrayal that they thought might get them into trouble. Well, there's been a template for this. And it was uh, when Heber J. Grant made a film. Now, those of you who are familiar with film would say, wait a minute, I've gone on imdb.com. I haven't seen a directorial list for Heber J. Grant, but he did. And he broached each of the issues that were brought up in the film, including that very worrisome descent into the abyss of vulnerability. And it was with the film Brigham Young in 1940. Up to that time, from as early as we know, from 1905 up to the dawn of the sound era, the church chose to not react to the more than 30 silent films that dealt with one aspect or another of Mormonism. Uh, you can probably guess what one aspect was that they dealt with, a plural marriage. And they would usually react after the fact, uh, not too strongly, but they would react. There's nothing they could do, was the reasoning. Well, when Daryl Zanuck, head of 20th Century Fox, announced in 1938 that this studio was going to make a multi-million dollar production on the life of Brigham Young, Heber J. Grant did something that no other church president had done. He recognized how important, how universal film was and the interpretations given by film. And he wrote to Zanuck, and said, uh, we've heard about this. We're anxious to work with you in any way we can. That is what divided the church's response to things going on in culture from a long legacy of not doing so. Probably scared off by the, uh, the Reed Smoot um, seat hearings in 1905 and 6. But what this began was a very effective collaboration with Lamar Trotty, 
who was one of the best screenwriters of the era, in fashioning this character of Brigham Young. Have many of you seen the 1940 film of Brigham Young? Yeah, you probably know what I mean. Here was a prophet who was beset by doubts, well-intentioned, but not a perfect individual, who at one point in the film indicated, you know, maybe the Lord wasn't speaking to me at all. Maybe, maybe this is just me. And his wife, played by Mary Astor, would continue to buck him up and encourage him. When the film came out, in a seven theater premiere in Salt Lake in 1940. President Grant got a lot of hits saying, hey, this, is, this isn't doing what we want it to do. It portrays this prophet, a, the one we know is a very strong person, with some uh, second thoughts, with some weaknesses. President Grant, again, did something that no other prophet had done. He took time in the October 1940 General Conference as he opened it to talk about the film Brigham Young and said, don't you criticize this. This is doing great things for us. Um, this was landmark. Well, what he didn't tell them was he had approved the script. Uh, the first presidency went down for script readings at 20th Century Fox. They approved that approach they approved of the court scene, which is very early in the film, where Joseph Smith is convicted of treason and Brigham Young stands up in the courtroom and defends him and gives a brilliant speech. In 10 minutes, non-members know more about Mormons and the issues that beset them in Nauvoo than any other film had. But that courtroom scene was a lie. Not one bit of it was true. The biggest part being Brigham Young wasn't even there in Nauvoo when the prophet was tried. But this was all approved. I think this was wise on President Grant's part, and he set the template for all LDS filmmakers in looking for that dramatic truth. And it's something, this courtroom scene and the other things in Brigham Young and President Grant's proactive stance uh, prompted me to think about a truism in that good films, can tell lies that tell truths. That courtroom scene was a lie in that, not that it was mean-spirited, but that it wasn't true to recorded history. But what that dramatic function did was it told many, many truths, and it worked. And to President Grant's credit, he knew it. So my feeling is, why don't we as filmmakers take up the cudgel from a, uh, a sitting prophet at the time and his approach to dramatic truth. As long as it tells truths, then the filmmaker can work within that parameter to accomplish it. And a prophet of the church set that example. Right here. Yeah. I wasn't going to speak up like this. But that was such a perfect entree to my dilemma. I represent a group of people who are interested in recouping, <coughs> excuse me, and creating a docudrama of the events of Mormons during the Mexican Revolution. I'm hesitating real <coughs> sharply to say a remake of the film, And Should We Die? Because we don't want to remake that old film. But that film fits perfectly into this dilemma was one of the very first BYU motion picture productions. They thought it was going to be a great film, and it was immediately rejected by the Mormon colonists in Chihuahua, who said, this is not factual. And then when it was aired to Mexicans who knew the story of uh, Rafael Monroy, they were <clears throat> astounded at the inaccuracies, and it resulted in the sister of Raphael Monroy, contracting with the scribe to tell the story correctly as she had witnessed it. So the film itself was then blacklisted and is in a vault and it's no longer available for anyone to see because both sides said this is inaccuracy and a false portrayal. Uh, but Judge Whitaker, I, I'm not sure if Judge was really the, the director on that, I think he was. Yeah, he was. Uh, yeah. 
I don't know what he thought, but did he think this was dramatic truth that told the right story? Uh, and so I'm opening that up uh, as not to change the discussion, but as another event in Mormon history, Mormon film history, that would like to rectify. And I, you know, I'm open to talk to anyone. This is my commercial plug to talk to anyone. <laughs> I have, I have one, interested in one comment that. to what you said. Uh, that it's not locked up in the vaults and unwatchable anymore. Uh, we have an uncut print in the BYU Motion Picture Archive, and it's available to be seen. So we have the original version, and then we have the cut version that can be seen. But it was from yes, general circulation, that's true. Is it on 35 millimeter? 16. That'd make it hard to screen. <laughs> no, it's not hard to screen. Uh, we've done a DVD transfer, and it can be seen at uh, the L. Tom Perry Special Collections oh. at BYU. That's great. I have a DVD. I took off a 16 millimeter. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, this is it. It's all over the it's place. It's everywhere. Yeah, it's yes, on it's YouTube. Nice. The pirates will confess. We <laughs> tell that story now using all of the, the experience that we have in both a historically accurate Rather than answer your question specifically, I just want to maybe address that just generally, and, and maybe it speaks to the reason I felt um, like it was important to make this film. And, and part of it was born out of my frustration with feeling like the church as an institution didn't give us um, all the f facts we needed or, or was reluctant to talk about difficult events like the one you're talking about. And, and as a result, you see a lot of people starting to, to leave the church or feel frustrated like they're not getting the whole picture. But I was also frustrated with friends that were leaving the church over criticisms for not being honest enough with our history. And I thought the, the factual record, regardless of how deep and how, how rich and how detailed it is, can always be interpreted and skewed. And so we, we, the film talks a lot about the, the onus and the burden on filmmakers to to deal with these tension, but I think there's a responsibility on the audience members as well to, to say, what is the the author or the director trying to accomplish and what is my responsibility as an audience member to sift through what, what they're trying to tell me, to try and seek not just the factual record, uh, the truth that's in the fact in the historical record, but the truth that that the Lord wants wants for me. And I think Garrett's point in the film was was an important one when if we can't deal with those tough issues to some extent, we do min minimize the hand of the Lord because we, we don't allow him to, to get us out of those deep holes. Jared. So all of you, I think, have spoken in this documentary, and I think because I know each of you, about the pressure or the fear that either you or the organizations you work for have felt about how the Brethren might respond to a movie. And it, feel, it seems that 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 question gets brought up quite a bit in, in church-related media production. Have you guys felt any actual heat from them? And if so, how did you deal with it? Or is this a straw man sort of argument that gets brought up to justify our own insecurities? I'm curious. <laughs> I think, uh, I think uh, just referring to what Mitch said in the film, you know, when we, when we try to put a wart on, on one of the brethren, uh, you know, we get concerned, and everybody gets concerned. And I, but I think that that's the truth that we need to embrace. And and the brethren probably need it. I I I don't want to speak for the brethren, but um, they are brethren. They're, they they are human. And so when we we we're committing the same error as our audience uh, when we say, can we show this? And and absolutely we can, and we should, and because that's the truth that needs to be. Be, be illustrated. I know that uh, for, for my particular film, um, that, that was a sensitivity. We thought, how do we, how do we show missionaries essentially being beat down and, and, and what is the missionary department going to, uh, how are they going to react to this? And it, it, you know, it was one of those things that we deliberated over and, and decided to move forward with and do it certainly tastefully. We didn't want to be gratuitous in, in any violence or anything, but uh, to be truthful, we wanted to be truthful, and 
since then is certainly the missionary department has heard about the film, has hosted screenings at the Legacy Theater, uh, invited the brethren to see it. And um, I certainly don't want to speak for, for the brethren, but the film is, has, has done very well and, and uh, they are extremely supportive of it. I think in, in some form, it's important to find a structure for the film too, or kind of find what is my story, and that guides a lot of the things. Like in my Joseph Smith film, um, I was going more about this young man um, feeling his mission is to translate this plates or getting this plates, and then um, the, the, the result that we all know is the Book of Mormon. But the historical thing that I found that I didn't feel like was explored maybe enough was that the timing of Emma giving birth to that uh, child that died right after or during childbirth, and the timing of him giving the, the pages to Martin Harris was, was the next day. So the next day the, the, the child died or the birth happened. And so having my wife go through the first uh, labor for two days or so, I, I kind of felt like there was a certain pressure coming from the domestic environment that put that pressure on Joseph to do that. But at the same time, that seemed to me kind of a low point. So it seemed like his personal life totally um, goes wrong, in a sense. And then he also loses the pages at the same time. And so I felt this is a moment for Joseph where he has to go so low and so deep that there's this, this theme of redemption came out of that. You know, He has to rise from that again and that's where I see the prophet happening. He's not a prophet up to this point. He's, he's just a human trying to figure out what to do. And then he loses everything, and there's this redemptive moment that he needs to find. And then he comes with a stronger force, and he translates that book in such a short time that we are all surprised. But, but that, that was kind of the, the key dramatic element. It, it, it circled around redemption, this, this boy trying to figure out what God wants from him. And, and going through that um, low point and then rising out of, out of that again. And I found it easier to have less information. You know, up to that point, a lot is like Lucy Mac Smith writing about it and some other sources like Martin Harris or Joseph Knight. But then once they get into, and then Oliver Cowdery comes in the picture and then so many things happen and it was really hard to keep it together. Like then there's the priesthood, this, this, this. And so how do you then wrap up that story about redemption? You know, when then <clears throat> members knowing the story about, but the priesthood is also important. You know, and this is also, this has also happened. So, so that's kind of a, that was a little bit hard for me. Um, and maybe to continue the, the, the conversation on that. So I have not much experience with my first film doing a historical portrait. And what I found as a filmmaker, even with my other films, is the unique thing is that we are making films for hundreds of thousands of experts on the subject. <laughs> and that really is unique. You know, everyone has a strong opinion. They know. See, when I watch Gravity, I don't care if that's all proper, you know? I just watched a movie. But if I were, uh, uh, what, what is it, astrophysic, or what, if I were in that kind of field, I'd say, well, that explode, that couldn't happen like that, you know? I would go like, oh, that's wrong. I can't accept that, you know? So, <clears throat> and so in our community, we know our stuff a lot. So we, people have these glasses on as an expert and analyze it and process it in a total different way than a normal person would do. And so films like, a uh, Saratov approach, people know a little bit about it, but actually that film gives people an opportunity to, to actually learn more about it, or even T.C. Christensen's film, even though we know a lot of the pioneer stories, but I think, or like you said in the documentary, Joseph Smith was um, not the main character, so, so I think these stories could maybe be a little bit easier to swallow for members if they're not, if they're not necessarily in the expert position. And so that's the same with a, a film about missionaries or a film about a bishop. You know, people have strong experiences and are experts in the field. And when I did Silent Night, all of that 
It's not a historical film about a Catholic priest. I had n not to deal with any of that. People would just watch the film and then say if they liked it or not, you know? And they didn't have that garbage of like being an expert on the subject. They could just relax and, and enjoy it, you know? And I don't know how we can bridge that, but I wanted to bring that up as, as something that is unique to our culture and, and, and how we can navigate through that as, as filmmakers. You know, the other side of that is we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't, because there are still a lot of stories floating around um, from missionaries who come back from the, uh, from the uh, uh, working in the Hill Camorra in the Palmyra area, who get members of the church asking all the time where the steed farm is. And so, uh, you know, I mean, you're right. We either know too much or too little about our history. I don't know which it is. Let's, uh, let's get a wide angle shot here. Isn't this a wonderful dilemma to be in? And I'll tell you why. Uh, if people didn't care, we wouldn't be here talking about reactions. Film has a power and a force that few other things do. Uh, the only other places that I see people gathering together in a communal way for two hours or more, t focused on something, to think about it, to let it roll around in their mind, to compare it to their own experiences uh, other than church, and that always doesn't happen in church, is one, a sports event, and we know what happens there. Not much time for contemplation, a lot of time for anger generation. The other place is the theater, where it's dark, it's focused on the screen. Those are the most intensive times where we have to see things portrayed with, a, with an entire environment of human life, visuals, dialogue, even emotional support with music. Um, yes, as Mitch Davis said, it is propagandistic, but what isn't? What isn't? And the fact that motion pictures can keep our attention riveted on life issues, on people issues, redemption issues, church issues, our issues. What other art form does that to that degree? So, um, you know, here, here for the dilemmas. And I think filmmakers are capable of tackling them. Uh, right here. So my question is then, uh, when, you, when you do a film, when you're working on a film, do you, are you thinking of yourself as Mormon filmmaker as a voice of the Mormon church or as just portraying the human experience? How, how recognizing yourself as an LDS filmmaker do you approach that? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Huh? Uh, no, I, I think of myself as a storyteller. My responsibility is to the audience. And, and I think that uh, I think each film is, is, is different. Um, you know, a while ago I made a comedy about Boy Scouts, and it certainly wasn't uh, intended to be an LDS film or a, you know, anything other than 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 a fun story. And so my approach was certainly different than approaching a a, a story about missionaries being abducted. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what I'm going to say. Um, Jacob, my answer to the question is I'm totally schizophrenic. I, I have a career inside the framework of, of Mormon culture, and I have a career outside, and it's easier for me to keep them separate. I'm schizophrenic. Yeah, I think that the story is first. I think there is, though, um, I mean, we, we, I think it's kind of like who do you make the story for, in a sense, too. You know, we, we talked yesterday about it. Should it be the one or the other? I think we should be able to tell stories to ourselves, you know, and that's a good way to learn to tell stories. Um, that doesn't mean we can't t uh, try to tell stories for, for a different audience, you know. Uh, I'm in Austria, I live right now there, and there's a national cinema there that's heavily government funded. If I would bring you all the films that were made last year, you probably would shake your head with most of them and say, what's going on? What is that? And if I would bring films from here to there, it would be the same, same kind of response. And some films would probably work in both worlds, you know? And so I think um, that's a little bit 
but in, in a sense, you always have an audience. You have, always have people that like it or don't like it. You, know? you, can't, you can't approach everyone. So the question is, um, whom do you hold the mirror up? You know, my company's called Mirror Films, and who do you want to have look into the mirror? Um, and then I don't think it's per se being an LDS writer or filmmaker. I see more like limitations in the terms of the money that you have available to do something that, that kind of restricts you and say, I can't do this. Or, and so I think that's one thing I want to work on to navigate away from, to, to think immediately when I write in terms of how can I pull this off as a producer or director and, and separate the two. Uh, and, and I think that would help. In, in, in the approach to that. Um, I just want to add one more thing to that, and that is uh, for the last 40 years, uh, <clears throat> I have heard endless discussions about the kind of question that, that you just raised. And the, the holy grail that we still haven't found yet is, is the crossover film. I mean, you know, we're, we're creeping towards that, and Saratov is, you know, is pushing on some of those boundaries. But we still haven't found the story, the context, the money, uh, the distribution uh, for an LDS filmmaker to tell some aspect of our story that will appeal and interest a wider audience. And I think what you're hearing today is there a lot of the reasons why uh, the sort of timidity that we all struggle with within LDS culture has in fact not allowed us to do what, what I think President Hinckley talked about in terms of helping to bring the church out of obscurity and out of darkness the way President Grant did with the Brigham Young film. So I think this is an ongoing issue, an ongoing struggle, and I suspect that when a filmmaker finds that story and gets it made, um, we're, it's gonna be a much a reaction like the Brigham Young film. There are gonna be members who are very unhappy with it, uh, just as has been the case, for example, with Richard Bushman's book, Rough Stone Rolling. I mean, there's a lot of division about that, and a lot of people feel like it's a testimony destroyer, and a lot of people feel like it's a testimony builder. So uh, this, this kind of struggle, I think, is going to continue, but I would like to see, before I move to the other side of the veil, I'd like to see somebody crack that nut and, and make that film that goes to a wider, a wider audience with some real integrity and, at the same time, makes money. Well, and to be honest, there was an attempt in the 70s to do that with Robert Bolt and A Man for All Seasons that... Uh, on the Joseph Smith story. On the Joseph Smith story. Um, that I think the brethren were excited about all of the universals that were inherent in uh, Paul Schofield's portrayal of Sir Thomas More and attempted to engage Robert Bolt, who wrote the play and the screenplay for A Man for All Seasons, released in 1966, to do a Man for All Seasons treatment on the life of Joseph Smith. And for various reasons that'll probably be detailed at another time, that didn't quite work. But there was an attempt to do that. And it could have been a, the crossover. But isn't the big challenge, because I'm not a filmmaker, I'm the armchair critic isn't isn't the concern for a crossover when do the universals take a back seat and the particulars rise to the fore in other words when is a peculiar people an attractive thing and when is a peculiar people a peculiar people and not universal good point I, another thing jacob i think if you are exposing yourself as an LDS filmmaker, I think you are criticized differently too by the audience. I think LDS people then have super high standards for you, what you're allowed to do and not to do. So I sometimes wonder um, how my experience would have been different if I would have always just said, hey, I'm from Austria, I'm Catholic, love the Mormon culture, I just want to make films about it. Um, I think I would have been received a lot nicer uh, in some ways, you know. I think, not that I'm uh, complaining at all, but I think there's like this high level of expectation that comes from an audience as soon as they hear, oh, it's one, of, uh, one from us, so he, he needs to do this and this and this. But if I come as an outsider, uh, they're a lot more appreciative 
of whatever positive aspect I bring into the you culture. South Park guys? <laughs> well, they, even they, yeah, I guess. <laughs> They would say something nice if it's not totally, you know. I mean, I think I think it's really possible. I think we need to kind of maybe, as a community, also embrace the artists and give them opportunities to work, give them a, a space to work. Um, and we need to realize, as a community, that we are responsible for them uh, to some degree. That they have that freedom to work and explore ideas, explore stories, and not under the umbrella of the church or the messaging of the church, but, but just freely explore things and hopefully as young as possible as they come out of film school, give them opportunities to do that, but have them do it independently and freely. Can I just say one more thing? Just since I was, I had to go first on that one. I just want to clarify my answer. Um, I mean, I, I have a brother who's an FBI agent, but he's not a Mormon FBI. He doesn't just go around solving Mormon crimes. <laughs> or, you know what I'm saying, or a Mormon dentist. And I think that that's important that we realize that, that our stories that we're creating certainly are influenced by my membership of the church, but I don't solely serve that audience. I don't intend to. Yeah, right. yeah, I'm, you know, I have a unique pers perspective because I, I worked on the distribution end early in the industry uh, when all these fil LDS films were being made. so. All these these conflicts we're talking about with the audience is accepting certain certain warts or you know uh, sins. I'm I'm aware of conversations and fights that happened among distributors whether to take a film and forcing them to make cuts to films and changing films and certain brethren liking certain films and certain brethren not not you know liking other films. But the thing the thing that seems to <laughs> overcome all those issues because there were some really wonderful little films that I fought for early on in distribution and we never seemed to get anywhere even after we made all the cuts the distributors wanted but then other films would come along uh, things like Singles War, things like Work in the Glory things like Saints and Soldiers and then now Saratov Approach the better the films are made and the more the audience accepts them it seems to overcome all those issues because there's no distributor that's going to stand up and say, I'm not going to distribute this film when it's making that much money when the, when the audience is accepting it. So I think the onus is on the filmmakers in the sense that their products are getting so much better. I mean, I look at all your products and I'm just, my hat's off. But also the audience stepping up and supporting that, uh, especially when somebody has the, the temerity and the honesty to, to portray the words. You know, uh, we need that. Because we make those mistakes, and we need something to relate to, and see that there's, there's a way to overcome these issues. Quickly, um, I hear what you're saying, but I'll tell you there there is a huge limitation from a filmmaker's point of view in our culture, and that limitation is uh, we don't have a good tradition of film criticism. And I don't know if you would agree with this, Absolutely. but you know if you if you make a major film that gets national release and you get reviewed in the New Yorker, the New York Times, or in, 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 in Los Angeles, or Variety, or the Hollywood Reporter, you get some pretty tough critical feedback, which in turn drives the way you think about your next project. We don't have that in this culture. Um, th there is no real, from my point of view, both tough but also intelligent sympathetic criticism. By sympathetic, I mean not critics who are just there to tear a film apart, but I mean somebody who'll really enter into the film trying to understand what the filmmaker's trying to do and then talk candidly about what the problems or the limitations are. We just don't have that. So everything that comes back is either measured by dollars or it's measured by anecdotal responses. It's this just this huge, very uncertain area. We just don't have that critical climate, which is, again, one of the reasons the LDS Film Festival is a good thing in terms of bringing people together. That was a plug for you. Good. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'd like your opinion on something. Sterling mentions this. You know, we have, we have certain masters that these film interests have to address in our finance and our marketing guys. Um, I'm an LDS filmmaker. Um, most of my work is outside of simply because about 15 years, 16 years ago to this day it still haunts me something that I heard. I was at the mall and um, I'm walking by Deseret Book and this lady comes screaming out. She goes, Mike, Mike, I turned it into a whole bunch. No, stop, stop, stop. She 
comes up to me, she said, they said that um, you're the guy that made that Christmas mission. Is that you? Was it Christmas mission was a little video a long, long time ago. I said, yes. And she goes, oh, man, we love it. We love it. We love it. And, you know, because of this, we've gone back to church where my husband and I are getting sealed next week, blah, 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 blah. And then what, what she said just sends shivers down my spine. She goes, we love it so much that we have borrowed it from our neighbors like a dozen times. <laughs> so, you know, you mentioned, you know, about the responsibility of the audiences, and then at the same time, we have a responsibility to our filmmakers, and you guys have all put out some, what I think are, you know, some really good, some really good product. How do we go and try to get the audience to become part of this process? become where they take on some responsibility. I th I'm sure every single one of us have heard, oh, I can't go to the woods because of all the garbage that's out there. But, you know, when you put out something, I'll borrow from your neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon and Purdy can probably speak to this better than anybody, but uh, anecdotally, I, I think we, we do do a pretty good job of supporting our filmmakers. A lot of the films, um, even if they're not LDS, that, that, but we know that they're made by LDS filmmakers, and because we have regional distribution, focused distribution, these films get more dollars and more, more eyeballs on them than I think they would in a lot of other scenarios, and certainly if they were picked up by sort of even small but nationally minded distributors. Um, and so, so you know, I, I, think, I think we do come out and support, and the, and the better the film is, as Garrett's movie is proving, the, the more people will come out and, and pay money to see it. I would, I would actually totally confirm that. I, I, our audience is awesome, actually. If you look at the sales numbers for this small market that we are, it's incredible. Like, if I compare it, Austria, again, uh, has 8 million citizens. We can maybe reach, I don't know how many million, it's probably less than 8 million in our market, right? I don't know if there's numbers. How far we can really reach to our membership or LDS people. These, like, DVD sales numbers and stuff, it's, it's way higher here. The support is way stronger. So I don't know if that's really the solution, because I think, again, in Europe, they had to find a solution for their filmmakers, and it, it, it goes through um, government funding. There will be no films made without that kind of funding. Um, and that allows them to have I think in Austria it's maybe average three million euro budgets, two three million euro budgets, um, to allow some sort of a national cinema to exist, besides Hollywood, you know, films coming in, and I think we're we could look at ourselves as kind of a nationality, within a nationality, that has a need to preserve a national identity, which is very strongly founded in a religious identity, but it's also a cultural identity, and someone needs to feel responsible for that. The audience actually really supports it. If, you, if Garrett's film will have numbers that, that Germany would be a, a blockbuster to have these kinds of DVD sale numbers that that, that film is going to have. So you can't really, I think we have a supportive audience from my point of view. It's just too small of an audience to sustain filmmakers and there needs to be sources to from somewhere else to do that. And I think also the mission-driven messaging of being supportive for you because I, I was there for the distribution, I mean, since Other Side of Heaven, and, you know, we had God's army that was worthy of saying, please go support this. But then the next five movies that we were like, if you're Mormon, that's the only criteria why you should go support this. And then people went to the movie and went to the movie, and then they were like, but will you entertain me also? Like, not, not saying they weren't, I'm just saying people started complaining about that. We got emails saying, you're asking for this, but will you give us this? And so for years, that's the whole messaging of what was driving uh, outside of Utah box office was, will you please support us? And then we got this kickback, and then it was almost like silence from our partners, you know, that were the grassroots people out messaging. So I think that's an interesting thing, too, that, that we ran into that. At the end of the day, an audience member has a choice to put their $10 down on a, on a film that costs $100 million or $200 million, or they can put their money down on a small independent Mormon film and so and going back to the to some of the themes in the documentary I think it is incumbent to recognize that there 
while trying to still be unique and still distinguish ourselves as a peculiar people, pulling out the universal stuff that makes it palatable for an audience and makes them want to put their, their $10 down to go see a, a movie that has Mormon themes and Mormon characters. And they're as happy to do that because they get the, the same experience as they would from a, a major Hollywood blockbuster film. But at the end of the day, they do have that choice. And, and, and that does put, I'm sorry guys, put an onus on the, on the directors a little bit. There's a line from uh, the film The Right Stuff about the astronauts. Uh, that Philip Kaufman did. And all these astronauts were being paraded around to different cities for these dog and pony shows to publicize the moonshots and everything. And uh, one of them, one of the characters said, you know, what are we, we're supposed to be preparing for our flight. What are we doing this for? And the comment that came back from one of the other astronauts, um, no bucks, meaning no support, no publicity, no money coming in, no bucks, no Buck Rogers. I guess I'm probably just going to reiterate that then it becomes the responsibility then of the, the LDS filmmaker or whatever filmmaker to not create a product that requires a crutch. And we say, look, let's compete then with whatever else is playing at the megaplex and certainly we won't ever make a 50 million we're not we're not at the point where we're making a 50 million dollar lds themed film yet but when you look at the independent spirit awards which many of those films are oscar nominated those are within the realm of films that we should be making and our stories and our distribution pattern and our connections should grant us access to those actors that will enable us to really make a, an impact at the box office and across the country. And that, that, that again, is probably, that's where our message needs to go. Thank you. Now, first, first of all, I don't, and, and I don't think we uh, think in terms of putting warts on our leaders. It's a matter of maybe leaving the warts on. Okay, I don't think anybody wants to put warts on. Secondly, I think the, the crossover film that you know, we're all looking for happened in 1940. Because Brigham Young was indeed a major Hollywood film with Mormon themes. And so maybe instead of you know, thinking, of, maybe we should look at that as an exemplar uh, in, in the sense of being able to do that. The other thing is, in terms of uh, Latter-day Saint filmmakers having the courage to take on the, uh, the tough subjects. Um, when I was working with the 30-day production back in 1976, we were talking about doing a film on the Utah War uh, that had been, uh, and, uh, but the idea that, um, when it was brought up in the, in the documentary, that if, if there is a tough subject out there, it's better that it's taken on by a faithful Latter-day Saint who's going to Leave the warts, but not make up a lot of terrible stuff. For example, the film that was done on the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Yeah. It was done by <laughs> September Turk Dawn. September Dawn, yeah. which thankfully did not get much of an audience. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if a Latter-day Saint says, okay, we're gonna do, that, that's a film that's going to get an audience because it's got an interest in, in the general public. But a Latter-day Saint is certainly going to approach it from a different standpoint than someone outside, like like was done in September Dawn. So I think we have to have the courage to step up when the occasion demands it, and to uh, to give it the quality that's going to make it that crossover. That, that speaks a little bit to the idea that opened the discussion about starting with. And I think filmmakers have to be careful to not start with a message, not start with, I'm not, okay, I'm not going to remove warts, but I'm, if you're going, going into a film to convert or to, or to make sure that church always comes out in a good light, um, you will end up with a different film than if you go in, as, as Sterling said at the beginning of the film, um, with, a, with a different kind of truth in mind. <clears throat> One of my um, my mentors I worked very closely with and produced 
two films with him. It was a man named Horton Foote. And um, Horton was a deeply religious man. He was a Christian scientist. Um, he wrote uh, the screenplay for To Kill a Mockingbird. Some of you may know that film. He wrote the screenplay for a film called Tender Mercies. He got Oscars for both those films. And I did two films with Horton. And um, I took, um, uh, I made, had an opportunity to bring Horton to BYU uh, to do a, um, a presentation. And afterwards, um, I took him up to meet with Elder Holland. And then Elder Holland insisted that he go over to the, um, uh, the Joseph Smith Memorial Building and see uh, Legacy, uh, the film Legacy. And um, I was a little anxious about that. Um, but Elder Holland insisted, so we went over and I sat next to Horton while it played out. And he said something very interesting when we, when we got through with it. Um, you know, he said, well, he said, I, I really appreciated that experience. He said, I, I'd always thought that Joseph Smith was a much older man. I didn't realize he was just this young, young prophet. And then he said, uh, from his perspective, as a screenwriter and as a playwright, he said, um, but you know, um, he said, um, it's, uh, it's interesting to me that the characters in the film uh, were so thin, were so unreal. Uh, and I thought, you know, what an irony. Here's a man who's a Christian scientist and um, who, who believes that, you know, there is no such thing as evil in the world, that evil is an illusion um, and doesn't believe in an embodied God. And yet at the same time, here we are as Latter-day Saints and our highest reality is a, is a God who has body parts and passions. And yet we tend in our characterization, at least in that film, um, to create these more abstract, unreal characters. And so I thought, well, what's wrong with this picture? What is it that's keeping us from, from going deeper uh, into our characters in a way that at the very least makes them come alive, makes them live? So uh, it's, it's, not only, um, it's not only a problem of audiences and a problem of money. It's also, it's also, and it's not just a problem of picking the story. It's also a problem um, of the willingness to let the character and the reality of the human condition lead the story. And that's not an easy thing to do in this, uh, in this culture. Uh, and again, you know, Garrett certainly came close, I mean, he's done beautifully with that. And so is Christian, frankly. I mean, I love what you did with... Um, plates of gold. I mean, you brought, I think, the prophet Joseph to life for me in a way that nothing else has. So we're, we've got the talent to do that, and we just somehow have to find that combination of story and money and everything else that all brings it together. I was making a comment about minority cinema in general that I think yeah, it would be interesting to, to sort of discuss also. That there's a, sort of a few different paradigms at work. You know, one that's easy, you can think of um, African-American cinema. You have the Tyler Perry paradigm, which is movies made mostly with black actors, mostly for a black audience in, in terms of where they, where they are uh, screened, where they make most of their money. Um, and then you have sort of a Will Smith paradigm. He's an actor who happens to be black, who can play any character, and people will recognize him as an international star. Um, and I think sometimes we, we focus more on the former, um, while wishing that they could somehow make the former into the latter. And, you know, um, if we only make things that are, are geared towards our own audiences, and if you build it, it will come. Those people are going to come to the, the subject thing. But if we could, could do a little bit more of the latter, in, and I think one of the difficult things is there's not a recognizable iconography of Mormonism. You, know, you can make a movie about a Catholic priest, and you know, everyone knows a Catholic priest has got that collar. That's why we keep on focusing on missionaries, because you have the name tags of the most iconic thing of, in, in Mormon culture, but if you find a way to, to make Mormon characters who happen to be, you know, we, we talk about being in the world and not of the world, but we make movies as though we weren't even in the world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> movies that are in another world. The world I don't even recognize, I'm, I'm, I'm in the Mormon world. Um, and uh, maybe it's like a group of dad who's not LDS and mom who is, and I grew up sort of bilingual in that way, but, but um, trying to find movies that can be bilingual uh, in the way we're talking about, I think it's crucial. Well, not only is, is that...
African American cinema a good point of conversation. But if you if you sit down and make a list, for example, of um, films that deal with some aspect of Jewish culture, I mean, you know, we're we're roughly now about the same population in America uh, as uh, as the Jews are, and yet they have managed uh, to to do that crossover thing that we're talking about. They've managed to give us glimpses sometimes into very traditional, very conservative Jewish culture, and yet still draw the universals out in a way that makes it compelling. We just haven't figured out how to do that yet. But Jews have a history. We don't. It's gone for eons. That's a big difference. And it's the same criticism that's made by Europeans and Americans. Well, you don't have a history. You've only been around for a couple of hundred years. I think there's something to be said for having something so embedded that there is iconography contained in it. There's, there are cultural, there's a cultural shorthand that everybody recognizes. Um, uh, more to our credit, that cultural shorthand is embodied in uh, Book of Mormon the musical, and most people have derived it from that. And I think those universals still not need to come out leavened by the peculiarities uh, to get the kind of audiences we're looking for. And I think Jewish cinema wasn't really that big before World War II either. You know, it was a very niche kind of thing, and it just became a more interesting mainstream culture after the war. And also, Jew being Jewish is not necessarily being Orthodox Jewish. If we would just have Orthodox Jewish films, I don't think you have seen many of those. And we do have, we do have the Will Smith. I mean, Ryan Gosling is a Mormon. You know, he grew up Mormon. He's not active. He's not an Orthodox Mormon at this point. But I mean, he's one of the best actors in Hollywood. Same with Amy Adams. You know, or Aaron Eckhart and and Catherine Heigl. Yeah. So we uh, we have we have these actors that have a strong LDS background. And, and, and I think Despicable 1 and 2, Despicable Me 1 and 2 was written by, by two LDS screenwriters. And we have uh, J.D. Payne later on today, who, who's, who's now writing on Star Trek 3. Uh, he's going to be here at 3, I think. So I mean, there is a college. Oh, this is you. <laughs> Good to meet you. <laughs> so, so you are in that area. You're in that, you're in that kind of thing. I mean, I think Hollywood is not a good not that easy place for conservative people in general. So I think the LDS people have it a little harder there too, in some respect, um, I think at this point. But I think that is the main difference that I see, is that we are mostly an Orthodox. And that goes along with we're all experts because we're all Orthodox in the faith. We're active, you know, Mormons. And so in, in the Jewish community, that is not a determinant, determining factor um, you are a Jew because not of how you worship, but just because that's that's where you belong. So basically, three different types of Jews you can be. Well, we even question how many different kinds of Mormons there can be, because we're looking for those telltale signs of who they are. Uh, they don't drink coffee. They may not drink Coke, but that's an argument these days, especially with the clarification in the past year or so. How much? Yeah, but we have plenty of neurosis. Plenty. Well, we have a, we have a lot of, we borrowed a lot of Catholic guilt. And Jewish but guilt, yeah. That's, that's right. And so then the other question is, well, what's your vision of what a prophet is and how much of a prophet's voice do you obey and still remain LDS? That isn't a problem with Jews. And from most of what we hear these days, that isn't a big problem with Catholics either. Uh, I want to quick uh, bring that question back to this idea of telling true stories, because I think it's really compelling and goes back to something Christian said as well about this idea of, and going along with the whole idea of the possibility of a uh, sort of crossover Mormon film. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, if you guys have any thoughts on if that's even a possibility if, if you can sort of serve all those different masters at once. For example, um, if you're telling a Joseph Smith film to a Mormon audience who knows the ending going in, 
you're going to structure it very differently than if you're telling the Joseph Smith film to uh, a non-Mormon audience who may know very little or, or nothing about him. So I'm wondering, um, as you're approaching telling true stories that we as Latter-day Saints may already know on film, um, how do audience expectations figure into the way you sort of crack a story, I guess, your, your approach to that story? Well, like I said earlier, I think it's easier to just find stories that people are not as familiar with. You know, I think that's kind of one, one of the conclusions um, that I draw. Another thing, I think that um, you can probably observe with Saints and Soldiers or the Saratov approach is that they were strong genre films. You know, first, so so uh, Garrett tried to do a thriller. You know, and 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 wrapped it, made a story with missionaries in a thriller. Um, Saints and Soldiers. Um, they disguise it even more, but for Mormons, it was it was a, a Mormon soldier. You know, they call him the deacon. He went on went on a mission, so they had some of that lingo that but also applied. Christians wat watched that film and thought he was a Christian guy. So, but it was a, a war movie, and he, I think it was sold worldwide as that too. So uh, I think, and we sometimes created that genre of the the LDS movie, which could be a comedy or, or a drama or, or something like that. But if you wrap it into a strong genre film, I think it becomes universal just by doing that. You know, um, yeah. So that's kind of the two things. Kind of maybe work more in in, in genres um, that are not specific the LDS genre, but just kind of uh, pick one. And and the second, find stories that are appealing to an LDS audience, but they're not necessarily familiar with that. Yeah. Are any of you familiar with the book Shattered Silence? Have any of you read that? Have you heard anything about it? I'm acquainted. Okay. <laughs> It's a young woman who eventually finds the church and joins, but uh, she had a horrible childhood, isn't that right? I'm hoping I'm telling it right. Her father was a murderer. I only published it, I'm not sure I read it. I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a compelling story. O Oprah Winfrey um, had her on her show, did a, a bunch of stuff with her, helped her print, you know, how many thousands of copies, you'll know. Yeah, and and that's a great story. The trouble is getting a Mormon like you guys to make it. it it's kind of squeamish. We're we're kind of we hold back from that sort of thing. Yes, and it's wonderful. It's a wonderful story, but you know, I mean, having a father who kills your friends is yucky. Maybe uh, Brandon, do you have anything? On that topic, as a from a distrib distributor standpoint, to answer that question, or of, of um, the baby raised term yeah, no. stories about crossover. Yeah. Is that where? Yeah. Because, uh, for example, I think of, and, and I think this goes along with what Christian was saying. Like Lincoln is an example of a film that you can market to an entire American audience, uh, and we all know the story, and you focus on sort of that small part of the story that we don't know. Uh, a Joseph Smith film, Mormons would all know, would all have that kind of familiarity with Joseph Smith as a figure like we would with someone like Abraham Lincoln going in, whereas uh, a non-Mormon audience would, would know nothing about Joseph Smith going in. So, so I'm wondering uh, how, if it's possible, um, and if it is, what does that look like for a uniquely Mormon story to be marketed to and appeal to both uh, Mormon audiences that know that story and non-Mormon audiences that don't? Or if, like Christian says, you focus on a story that no one knows. What advice would you give to yeah. in, in these guys' are shadows? I distribute, so I, I'll leave that to the, the pros. But I, as a distributor, I mean, that happens all the time. Like, you look at Tyler Perry movies or black cinema, and and the ones that have really focused on, you know, like uh, Buford, Georgia, Mall of Georgia 20, that, that theater is a 20-screen theater and has 20 screens of that movie on opening day, 
and sells out. You look at Saratov that gets number one per screen average in the country on its opening day, and every screen's in Utah. But then you look at, and I can't think of the name of the movie, it was Christmas, was it, uh, no, it was, a, it, was a, it was a black cinema movie that came out this Christmas. Yeah, Black Nativity. Their goal was to take the weakest box office week of the year and to do 1,800 screens, and, and uh, uh, more, more of the screens were outside of that belt of where the normal gross is than was, and it grossed and it was in the top 10. So marketing precedes the miracle, right? So like a movie can cross over if you can spend the marketing to invite the people. Now, will it be profitable? That's a totally different equation. One that I'm, I'm almost exclusively concerned with. That's as a distributor. I want investors to make money, therefore, they can continue to fund movies, therefore filmmakers get to continue to make movies. So that's super important to me. But I think that you could take a movie, the, if it was the right movie, and you could sell it to the national audience, and you would, you would get people to come out to see the movie. I mean, I think it's marketing. Everybody can buy TV. Everybody can think of smart social strategies and grassroots strategies. And it just comes down to, to the economics of it. So. concept of the crossover movie is very, very fascinating and it's very attractive and it's a neat term and we like to throw it out there. But my question is, at what point does um, a movie that is made by, at what point does a movie that crosses over still, is it still called a, a Mormon movie? You know, Gravity is, it, NASA is not sitting around saying, we finally got a crossover movie. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, we need to make, it, it's, it's, a, it's, not a, it's a human experience movie. And I think whether it's made by a Mormon or not, that, that, is, that is the goal. What, what's happened to the documentary myth? That's a, something of a crossover. Here. I mean, that's, that, that, that's picking that up. Uh, it's two amazing. National People presidential are campaign. getting a whole different look. Right. There was some so advanced publicity. publicity. <laughs> $600 million makes that a, is that a Mormon movie? <laughs> what makes that a Mormon movie? <laughs> because it's about a Mormon. It's made yeah. by a Mormon. Yeah. So we could make films about Mormon celebrities and try to, I mean, it's possible. I'm saying, I, if we say we make a film that has LDS themes, you know, Mitt doesn't have LDS themes, but if it is about him and it's about his, his character and, and family, but it seems that, that, that your base is kind of important to get the film out, you know, and you can kind of see it with God's Army versus God's Army 2 or States of Grace, you know. Uh, by the time States of Grace came around, he kind of lost his core audience, and outside of that core audience, no one then really cared either, you know? And so it's, it's hard then to get the film out, because who then will have the interest, you know? Well, as if you have, like Saratov Approach has a strong core base uh, following and viewers, then it has the chance to, to expand and go, go further, you know? And you need that. I mean, even... Some of the examples you have with, with black cinema or, or, or even my big fat Greek wedding, I mean, the way they marketed that, you know, it went straight to the, to, to the core audience first in order to get the word out, you know. And maybe we just have to all move from Utah into different areas to expand our reach, you know, so we are not as spread in other, in other states. So I should move to Austria maybe, yeah. Uh, the other way to look at that, too, is that even with all the money in Mitt's campaign, he couldn't cross over, so. Yeah, back here. did not come and did not play a factor in it, and they were worried about these things, but there was a lot of criticism. So because you guys are getting a lot of criticism, don't think it's just because it's LDS. It's because people are going to be critics. We have people call in all the time about the most ludicrous stuff, you know, in our movies. So don't be afraid of making a movie. That's the thing that they are doing. The conspirator, a good friend, Greg Bernstein of mine, he wrote that, and he's Jewish. And it's history. A lot of people are going to take, take fault with what you're doing because it's not their way. But don't be afraid to make them. I, that's what we're wanting. We're wanting the Saratosh approach. We're wanting these good things that are going to go out there. 
So I'm, I'm just saying, please start making movies. Don't worry about that it's LDS. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I, I lived in Glasgow, Scotland, and worked with their film community for a while. And I've, a lot of people have seen Train Spotting. I mean, that's their crossover movie. And the thing is, like, never, nobody ever, that movie wasn't supposed to be a crossover movie. I mean, Train Spotting, in the very title, is a very odd hobby to have in the UK of watching trains the way we watch birds and things. Like, hobbies will stand by train station and watch trains come in. And so, I mean, everything about it is regional, local, the dialect, but it just cross over. You know, and I think it's just random. Like, you just keep making movies and then something's going to click. And, but even then, like the reaction, there's a lot of people in Glasgow who view train spotting as like the Book of music. Like they hate it. Like they, they just like about drug addicts and violence and like everything that's nasty about Glasgow. I think most outsiders see it, you know, sympathetic and actually, you know, enjoy it and feel like they get to know the community. But they have, but there is a very polarizing feelings about it. And of course, you know, that launched his career, that guy, whatever. What's his name? Danny, Danny Boyle. Boyle. Danny Boyle, you know. So, but I, I do just believe that with art in general, there, you can't anticipate, you can't program, you just make and then stuff happens. You know. Or does it? That's comforting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, been, there's been some success in television. For example, uh, at one of our media art seminars for the Associated Latter day Media Artists, or ALMA, down in, in LA, one time we, Glenn Larson, LDS producer, uh, was there and we talked about some of these subjects and he went out and made Battlestar Galactica, which had, you know, the planet Cobol and the Quorum of the Twelve and all this stuff kind of woven into the story. Um, even, uh, you know, alien, advanced aliens saying, you know, as we are, you may become, as, as you are, we once were, you know. Uh, and then there's another very probably little known film that was a CBS television movie called Go Toward the Light which featured a, a, a young nine-year-old LDS boy who contracted AIDS through a uh, uh, blood transfusion. And it's a story of his, you know, his parents take him to the bishop and they talk about the process of dying. And so we have had some of these. And so I think we, part of it is, is learning to know what has worked, what has been a part of it. But, you know, you guys can react to, you know, what, what can we do in that area? We kind of went from uh, history and Mormon film to crossover. Um, maybe we need to mention Napoleon Dynamite in that context too, because in what way is that a Mormon film? Is it Mormon humor? Is it Mormon culture portrayed in some ways that did cross over? And even in that case, I think they were able to um, get that film some buzz by it playing in Sundance and a lot of people from here that knew Jared or were invited went up and, and it was a really good launch of the film, you know, so but but that was that's maybe an example of, of the most successful crossover film that that just portrays culture without people even knowing, you know. Well, I even look at, I'm, I'm thinking about this metaphor of crossover, and it almost sounds like Star Wars. You know, do you cross over to the dark side? Are we going somewhere where we really didn't want to go in the beginning? And I suspect what crossover means is we're looking from, we're looking at a perspective of something that we perceive as unacceptable to something that is. Isn't that what we're talking about in crossover? And I use this attempt by some in the church to use Robert Bolt to write a Joseph Smith story. Why? Well, audiences were pre-sold on an image of Sir Thomas More in A Man for All Seasons. So crossover is aligning your basically unknown commodity, Joseph Smith, with someone who is known and is perceived as favorable, Sir Thomas More. Well, the hitch there is, Robert Bolt's Sir Thomas More was not a Sir Thomas More that existed. Sir Thomas More burned heretics, was in favor of doing it, but you didn't see that in A Man for All Seasons. So what are we talking about? We're talking about image making. And what Mitch Davis talked about as propagandizing, in a way. But then we began this discussion with talking about history and truth. 
well, this is this is a snowball that you know a rolling stone that gathers not moss, but what does it gather? And I think as those who are trying to portray historical fact is embodied in the term history. Well, that's his story. That's this individual's take or this individual's slant that's shaped by time and circumstances, which is even acknowledged in the, uh, in the church's statement on race and priesthood, which showed up on gospel topics. There was an acknowledgement that culture and cultural milieu has an influence even on prophets. Well, why wouldn't it have that kind of influence on filmmakers? And why should we apologize for it? All right. Any other questions? Um, I, I have another question. Uh, going along with what, what you've just said um, and what, what we've, where this conversation has gone, um, I wonder if, uh, if the way we tell uh, stories about our history, um, if that's fundamentally different, if we're talking to ourselves and to each other, um, versus if we're uh, trying to tell those stories to um, someone who's coming at it from a, from a, a different vocabulary and a, a different uh, understanding of, of history. Um, that phrase, that question was better in my brain, but uh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what your question is, but I have a, it, it spurred a, a thought, and yeah, but you have an answer. I have an answer. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, I, I get a little, I get a little discouraged and a little concerned when, when, and, and the issue of orthodoxy was brought up, and I think we've got to get to a place as, and maybe this goes back to the comment about the audience. We've got to get to a place where we're a little more open to see some different versions, and we're not going to ignore film because it is a little unorthodox or takes uh, the filmmaker takes a slightly different view of history than than the official narrative from Salt Lake. We've got to be open to that and I and I'm afraid that we as a culture by not being a little bit more open-minded might push some very talented storytellers outside of our our culture and our church. It's happened. Um, Rebecca Thomas made a great film called Electric Children about a polygamous community. Not sure if anybody's ever seen it. it. Wasn't really branded as a Mormon film, but you know, she clearly showed a lot of talent in that film, and and would love to see her, you know, s still making films, LDS films, and being a, an LDS filmmaker. But I worry that we need to ch just be a little bit more open to some different interpretations as as audience members. Can I add to that? It was a point I was going to bring up earlier that as LDS filmmakers to not be afraid to be led where you go because there are intended consequences that you have as a filmmaker and then there are unintended consequences that the viewer gets. And I'll go back to this Brigham Young film again. The reason that church members came after uh, President Grant on this was that there was a prophet who had some doubts but who basically was shown by the end of the film to have done the right thing. Put yourself as a Mormon filmmaker in that situation. And I suspect one of the reasons that he approved this otherwise heretical narrative, at least to a lot of church members, is that's what life is all about. And as President Uchtdorf brought up last October in general conference, uh, these things do happen, but they don't go to intent. They often go to the process of working things out. And where the film Brigham Young was concerned, I, believe me, I read all of the reviews in doing my research of that film. 98% of them were laudatory to the character built in the film of Brigham Young because they saw themselves in him that beset by doubts and by incredible challenges, he was victorious. He did the right thing. And the criticism came from those within the church that had a perception that prophets don't have these and that people don't have these. The yes, the experts. So one of the great missions, I think, that Mormon filmmakers have is to liken life unto themselves. And therefore, 
these are rather not doubt creating but faith promoting activities well you answered my question um, well that's uh, that's all the time we have so let's uh, give a round of applause for our panelists <laughs>